misrepresenting facts about professional expertise seems to have become a norm in the corporate sector. Research reveals one out of every six candidates applying for jobs lie on his or her resume. These FIPS have led to resignations of employees in senior management of major corporates. Such frauds adversely impact stock values. Negligence in pre-hiring checks have led many dubious personnel to sustain in the system for far too long. Another rising concern for India is the prevalence of lawyers, quacks, doctors and other nursing professionals with fake or dubious credentials. At times, employees based in India and abroad themselves are unaware that their degrees obtained by distance learning programs are fake or that they invested in fake universities. Who is to blame? What is the government, regulatory bodies, corporate India and Indian law doing about the risk of misrepresentation and associated frauds? Let us find out in this week's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of India Risk Report. And in this episode, we are exploring how misrepresentation and misappropriation of facts and degree qualifications and employee qualifications can lead to so many frauds and there are cases that are coming to light across India which are causing alarm, particularly in the corporate circuit where there is a greater rush to employ the next qualified employee who comes in with fancy credentials, a well-written CV and articulate enough to meet the expectations of the HR. But the big question remains that are they competent enough to deliver on the expectations of the management? And we have uh, two experts here who have looked at the subject. We have uh, Colonel Vineet Sagal, who is Vice President of Risk Management at IRIS and comes in with a lot of corporate experience. Of course, his hands-on experience in the Army, but there you did not have to go in to do verification of the guys who came under your command. That was done at the enrollment or recruitment stages by the various headquarters and world. And we have a very eminent lawyer, Mr. Suchito Chatterjee, who is independent but has a fairly good understanding of where are the legal dilemmas in both sticking to the letter of the law, but at the same time, how to ensure that the companies uh, are able to protect their information, their employees, and not offend an prospective employee by telling him that unless your degree certificate has two more notary stamps on it, I don't find that as acceptable. Notary stamps have a mysterious way of appearing in all sorts of documents. So, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, I want to ask you, uh, the first is about allegations about the legal community. Some years ago, we had had a report that about 45% or so of the lawyers practicing across India uh, had questionable or dubious qualifications. And subsequently, you had uh, a very senior member of the Bar Council of India to come out and did make an assertion that as per their records, uh, about 55% or thereabouts of lawyers actually had acceptable qualifications. So the question one is, do you always need a qualification to practice law if you understand the law well enough to be able to defend yourself and your case with or without a lawyer? And secondly, why is it that the legal fraternity uh, is the one that tells us the way forward with the law is not able to effectively enforce the requirements of having qualified people to operate at the bar? So I, I think there would be four parts to what, what you're asking as answer. So A, there has never been a uniform method of evaluating who can be a lawyer, right? So no, no two law schools are comparable. And there is a list of um, elite law schools, if I may use the term, where the grading or the competition through an examination process is ensuring that at least um, people with capability of expressing themselves, understanding and scoring well are going to be lawyers. 
and this is a recent phenomena, maybe um, 20 years old at the most. But you still have law schools which are clearly not going to produce such high quality lawyers, trained lawyers I mean. The other part is when you are out there in the practice, not everyone is a litigator, not everyone is appearing in a court of law. There are so many dimensions of practice of law. So I, I guess to uh, you know, put them to all one standard would be difficult. Second part uh, to the answer that you were seeking, does one need to be um, a lawyer to represent oneself? The answer clearly is no. I think the concern in the higher courts particularly is wastage of time because you are not well trained. So you may emotionally ramble or not be focused wasting the time of the court. Uh, so other than that, there is nothing which stops you from representing yourself. The vested interest in terms of, so there have been some back and forth, compulsory training, post law school, then writing a bar council examination. Fortunately, some of it is becoming a reality. Mm -hmm. And the bar council has had its own struggle in the past to implement it. Mm -hmm. There was one pushback and fortunately now it is there. Outside of India, there is an examination which is national or a state level examination where unless you qualify with a certain amount of percentage and they determine how many people go to bar, there is no way you are entitled to practice law. So for example, in Japan, uh, you may go to law school, but it is more difficult to be a lawyer than to be, say, a diplomat or a civil servant. In as much as it's very easy to become a lawyer in America and a very prosperous one <laughs> that before, uh, before but, you end uh, up joining but White House. said that, there, is, there, uh, there are extremely successful lawyers who uh, may or may not have gone to the best law schools. Yes. Okay. Colonel Segal, Mr. Chatterjee has really spelt it out nice and clear in terms of the legal dimension. Now, two questions for you. One is, in your experience in HR, particularly in the corporate world, and you were earlier also with big companies, did you find that the pressure exercised on you by the superiors, the MD, the CEO, whoever, to say, get me more accountants or get me more tech savvy managers or ones who understand computing and marketing or whatever else, get me them by next Monday and in the bargain, you do advertise, you have a pool available with you already of potential talent, you have your contacts with other headhunters who immediately send you names. But how many times have you personally been disappointed with what appeared to be a good choice? Well, the pressure of hiring people as of yesterday uh, will always exist and in, the, in this fast competitive world, we, uh, we, we are never going to be having the luxury of time to say that, okay, take your time and give me a candidate. But I think what, what we need to ensure is that we need to make a clear distinction between, between the, the level at which we are hiring the people. I mean, somebody who is who's who's to be handling a huge responsibility, which, is, which, is, uh, which has financial implications and implications of the other nature with the, with the corporate world, you can't really rush those hires. Now, if you do that, you are actually, you know, making yourself susceptible to, to a scenario where this hire may come back to haunt you at a later stage. And that's where I think uh, corporate world needs to definitely make an make a, uh, assessment of, of people in the right way. But yes, people, when you're hiring at the, at the entry level, uh, where the pressures are immense, the number of people to be hired are more, the time available to you is is very little. You may end up, uh, you know, hiring people, but that really doesn't absolve you of going back and 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 seeing to it that does this candidate have the right credentials? Doing the doing the background verification in in its entirety. Uh, to give you an example, uh, a lot of companies feel that this is an investment which they probably will will not make, uh, but on an average. Uh, Background verification would cost you uh, the salary, the first day salary of the employee. Okay, I mean, good. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stay there. Uh, I'll come back to you because there's another element element to it that I want to add to it. Uh, Mr. Chatterjee, 
In July this year, the Punjab government withdrew Harmanpreet Kaur, Deputy Superintendent of Police, the rank of that lady, and she was earlier India's T20 cricket captain because they found that after verification, her graduation degree was fake. Likewise, there are many cases of people picking up fake degrees, not just in India, but even in Dubai, where, you know, there is a particular company, a firm called AXACT, is a Pakistani firm which sold degrees globally and for a price. Uh, at the same time, India was known to have multiple fake universities offering fake degrees. Now, broadly, the case is there. It's not a one-off that we are debating. What is the legal way out for a corporate organization when they have employed somebody whose degrees turn out to be fake? Uh, do you get them arrested? Do you get sack them? How do you re retrieve the damage that has been caused? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I think my experience shows that the corporates are reluctant to file a case against an employee. In fact, um, what I find that they find it damaging to their own reputation and that is more of concern. So usually it would be a very quiet parting and uh, they would move on. That clearly is not their legal recourse and I don't think so we can hold anybody inside HR alone responsible for this because I don't think so the HR departments are equipped for it. Um, unless and until somebody did a very deep investigation, the police agencies don't have the time, they don't have the training. So th I think the real uh, issue is you are hoping that whatever little investigation is being done by an independent agency or your own HR team or the verification that is being done through a government agency is sufficient. But Okay, so I mean that's that's where we stop right now because of shortage time we need to take a break and uh, we'll explore after a break uh, what other steps would be recommended for corporates and business communities and even government organizations to ensure that as far as possible they don't get um, saddled with uh, incompetent or inappropriately educated staff but that after break. Welcome back. We are looking at the risk to companies and corporates when they are in a rush to hire people who appear to be suitably qualified but often turn out to have dubious or questionable qualifications. And Colonel Segal, uh, we were talking about your experience when people are hired and how you find that you are not able to get the entire machinery of the country to work in your favor because of the variety of limitations that are in our country. And Mr. Chatterjee himself rightly brought out that it is very difficult uh, for the corporates and they often like to keep it under wraps both to protect their reputation and also the fact that you are not going to have much luck if you're going to involve the police to try and help you with verification. So I want to ask you that there are uh, any number of cases that are not just in India, but worldwide. You know, there are some very big cases. Uh, a very important CEO of an American company, Scott Thompson, uh, of PayPal. You know, he joined in January 2012, left in May 2012, and later it was investigated that his credentials were found to be uh, inadequate in computer sciences, but he was in the system, he would have left with data information, he would have left with stuff which would have damaged PayPal, which is a big company. Likewise, you have many cases of uh, uh, David Tover, Vice President, Corporate Communication, Walmart, resigned after it was discovered that he did not have a bachelor's degree in arts from the University of Delaware. Now, my question is, Bill Gates also didn't complete all his qualifications, but Bill Gates ended up becoming the big icon that he is. So the first question that I need to understand, that if a person has the necessary skill sets that a company wants, and in probation the person 
does fulfill the requirements of the still sketch and even admits to you that listen I am not a bachelor of sciences in computer technology, but I know how to handle it better than anybody else. Would you still be adamant on retaining him or would you be adamant that because we had advertised for a bachelor of sciences and I know there is that moral clause that he should have told you before he took the job and not appear to be deceitful quiet then and then got the job and exhibited himself. So, how much are you bound by just seeking the right qualifications in people than seeking the right skills? Skills are important. I mean, we, we cannot say that skills uh, even devoid of any qualification the person may have are not needed. But the question is, uh, was the candidate honest enough to admit it? I mean, if I find that he lied his way through the job, uh, then I, I'm, not, I'm not looking at his skill or his degree. I'm looking at his integrity. Now, if a, if a candidate uh, is, is lying to get into the job, he is most likely to lie uh, while, while he is through onto the job. And that's, that's what will worry me more uh, rather than just his skill set. But having said that, uh, you know, corporates need to protect themselves from, from insider threat. Now, once you have the person inside your system by fraudulent means, there is very little you can do to keep a check on him through the time when he is doing his job. Now, he may be handling sensitive information. Not is he is he taking that information to himself, copying it, uh, keeping it for his his uh, personal use, and so on and so forth. It will be very difficult for you to keep a tab on all of that. So it's very important at the hiring stage uh, that we make sure that we hire the right person. And background verification doesn't only mean his skill set. There are other dimensions to it, like for example his criminal record. Now. That's, that's very important. He, he, we need to understand what kind of a person he is. Now, other than that, because that, that directly affects uh, you know, the safety of employees uh, in, in your company. The, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know he, he could indulge in theft while he's inside your organization. So, so criminal check, his uh, check of his qualifications, check of his background, his address check. Now, I may say that I'm an Indian national, but I may not be. How do you know that I am not an international? Until unless you perform a uh, proper checks uh, while hiring me, uh, you will you will never come to know. I mean, if you just believe me, I can. No, I can my short question is: yeah. Are all corporate organizations rigid about doing a whole list of checks? There must be by now in the market a series of do's and don'ts that must be available. And if you follow that, you more or less come close to all the points that you are talking about. Yes. Uh, most of the corporates, the, the, the big ones, the good ones, uh, would definitely perform a check. But as we, we discussed earlier, there are pressures of hiring. Some of these, uh, you know, at, at some level are given a, uh, a given a go by and say okay. that, okay. Yeah, so that, yeah. that, that pressures uh, are different. Uh, Mr. Chatterjee, uh, doctors and quacks and nurses are another area of concern. Now, here is a bigger concern because if you don't have suitably qualified people, you cause losses of life. And there are figures doing all sorts of figures doing the rounds. A World Health Organization report of 2016 says 31% of those who claim to be allopathic doctors in 2001, the report came in 15 years later, were educated only up to secondary school level and 57% of Indian doctors did not have any medical qualifications. This became a bit of a news item when a 19 year old boy this year in April was found to be masquerading as a doctor in All India Institute of Medical Sciences till one of the doctors noticed that he seemed to have too much free time to float around with stethoscopes around his neck and attend every seminar, every conference, but he wasn't attending to any patients. And it was later found, obviously, that he was an imposter. So you have that problem. And then you have problems about nurses and you have problems about various other, uh, I mean, we have a tradition of having quacks in small towns and streets and gullies who sit around and, you know, part all kind of medical aid to people. But that's a separate story altogether. Here we are talking of India wants to become a global medical destination. But do you think it's doing our reputation any good if bulk of our doctors 
seem to have dubious or questionable qualifications and if you do find them and because you have an intent to practice medicine without qualification, you could be causing serious harm to human life. There is a legal dimension to it. If so, what is it? So clearly, uh, if I mean, there is no ambiguity that if I misrepresent and hold out to the world at large to be somebody who I am not uh, actually. So if I I could be an imposter in terms of identity, I could be an imposter in terms of my qualification and my vocation. And all of that is definitely criminally prosecutable. Mm -hmm. um, the state can act on its own. So if you remember there was this major case some years ago about the man who used to operate kidneys mm. out of Gurgaon and that wasn't the first time he was doing it. Mm. right? So I think uh, the answer legally is of course you have remedies. The question is who will prosecute and what kind of state, uh, state commitment we would have to it. Mm. Um, we also have glorification from Bollywood and Hollywood to people who are exceptionally talented. Um, so we have Munna Bhai at one end and yeah. we had the Hollywood equivalent of it uh, in the name of Patch Adams, really classic case where an American medical student used to give out medicines and treat people in his farm and he even today continues to do it though the American Medical Council barred him. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, Colonel last question, brief answer. What in your experience are the real dangers and what's your advice to corporates to deal with dubious qualifications? So the real dangers lie after you've hired a wrong guy in terms of the frauds he can commit and in terms of the harm he can cause to your organization, both financial and reputational. Those are the real dangers of hiring a wrong person. The short answer to, to this problem is that companies, and I'm not talking about the corporate world, we, we talk about hospitals, we talk about you know educational institutes, security agencies. All of the people who are, who are hiring people must do a due diligence before they hire people on board. And there are standards available. All we need to do is we need to not succumb to pressures and say, okay, come what may, I'm going to hire the guy. At least let's look at, am I hiring the right guy? And that's very important. Okay, so this is very well put. Actually, there are challenges galore in terms of not just double checking, triple checking qualifications that are presented to you, particularly in a growing culture, not just in India, but in South Asia, and it's extended uh, discreetly into even countries like Dubai, where uh, degrees and qualifications are being handed out for a price. But the challenge is to ensure that you quickly double check the qualifications of the people you hire, particularly not just to guard the company's reputation and the financial damage, but equally, equally importantly, uh, in terms of the doctors who are allowed to practice and because their uh, role uh, is very, very important in terms of saving or losing lives. But all in all, this is a subject which is extremely important for uh, the reputation of India and the reputation of the various opportunities that India presents to the international community to do business in India or to engage with India, but they would only be willing to wait and watch for a while, after which their attention will turn to a more reliable entity. Thank you very much for being with us on the show. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye.